Hello and welcome to the News at 7 here on FECTV.com. I'm Noel Byrne and joining me this evening is Alan Noonan. We've got all the latest on today's top stories and we're kicking off this evening with the whole fiasco at HMV. It has of course gone into administration with Deloitte Ireland being appointed there. Uh, 300 jobs are at risk around the country. There are 16 stores in total but the staff at the two Limerick stores are taking a stand. They've decided to sit in because they are fighting for their wages that they are owed. It's a bit of a rocky time for the staff, I suppose, because in these type of situations, they're always at the bottom of the list for the people who have to get money back. Yeah, exactly. It seems like uh, the uh, staff, the people who bought vouchers, and in particularly sad news, it seems like this uh, charity collection is not is at the bottom of the list as well with regards to people. So you've got the tax man, you've got the shareholders, and then at the bottom of the list you have this. You have a bit more on that story. No, yeah, the you? charity aspect is is an interesting one. Um, a song for Lily May, of course, was released uh, before Christmas. The hope was to get it to Christmas number one and raise funds for Lily May, who is indeed a cancer patient. She's only a young child. Um, the money from that was all being handled by HMV, and it's understood that in the region of €27,000 has still to be handed over to the charity who are looking after um, Lily May. So, I wonder, are Deloitte going to be kind of handling that, like as in, would it be one of the first things they handle, or is it, as you said, kind of below the, the tax man? And, and the uh, well, at the moment, in the order, it is definitely below it. Um, but the problem is, is that this is going to be an absolute PR disaster for Deloitte if they decide yeah. to, to not pay out this money. It's already, they're already facing a lock-in from staff up in Limerick, and I believe you're going to be talking to one of those staff later on in the show, yeah? Yes, on tonight's uh, Your Call Live here on FECTV.com, we're going to be talking to manager Chris Keena about what's going on in the store in the HMV in the Crescent Shopping Centre, so do stay tuned for that exclusive interview. As I said, that's tonight at 10pm. Uh, a couple of other things, as you mentioned already, the vo vouchers not being, um, you know, used by the yeah, stores, which, they're not accepting them anymore. Yeah, which Pat Rabbit believed uh, was not exactly a surprise. I think he, he used the words uh, earlier on in the week, and I wish he had told us that it was not exactly a surprise earlier on, at, before Christmas maybe, when people bought, you know, hundreds of euros worth of vouchers for HMV that they're not redeeming anymore. But there was one man in particular in Dublin who decided to take it upon himself to go into HMV, uh, take out three games uh, worth 48 euros in total, hand them 40 euros in HMV vouchers, and they walked out the store, try and convince them to come back and pay <laughs> in actual cash for the goods, but he refused, saying that he'll mail the eight euro to them later. Yeah, fair play, to, fair play to him. I mean, he was obviously fed up because I know he did try to, you know, use the voucher and they yeah. kept turning him down, so he just, he had enough. Well, he said that himself. He said that we sit down and take too much in this country already, so I, I respect him as well, actually, for standing up for, for what... Uh, no, fair play to him. Um, I do question his sense of, in, of gaming, though, just to let uh, viewers know. The games in question that he took were Euro Truck Simulator 2, The Sims 3, Town Life, and Rail Simulator. Not exactly, you know, chart toppers. No, I can't imagine myself going into a shop and buying Rail Simulator, I'm yeah. afraid. I, I, no. uh, obviously the games obviously were for his grandson, who's quite a fan of simulation, I'd imagine. And maybe trains. And, and maybe trains too. Uh, the next news story is leading us to Algeria, where a botched rescue operation of hostages has ended up in the death of approximately 34 people by Algerian government. Um, this was particularly troublesome because some of the nationals that were killed, it was uh, partly owned by BP, but furthermore, the British authorities weren't informed by Algeria that this operation was going ahead. Uh, Cameron was not told until the operation had begun. That's David Cameron, the Prime Minister. Uh, extremely concerned, he was extremely concerned at the very grave and dangerous situation. Um, one Irish person was rescued during the operation, Stephen McFall and he is alive and well. The group, the militant that attacked the gas plant, were the Signed in Blood Battalion. Yeah, interesting name for them, but it was a funny day for that situation because obviously, you know, since the airstrike from the Algerian troops, I mean, there was conflicting reports across the spectrum in the media, unverifiable for a lot of it, you know, and a lot of them unconfirmed as well. So it was a tricky one to track and see what was actually happening compared to what was being reported. Um, so there's a lot of news coverage, as Absolutely. I said, with conflicting reports there. The um, 
Al-Qaeda members themselves, the militants, they have requested for the release of 100 Islam, Islam, Islam extremists, I'm not sure why that was so hard to get out, um, in Algeria, and they want them to be sent to northern Mali. Mm. I guess they're a scary bunch, that's why it might have been difficult to say. Yeah. But also, it seems like some of the difficulty with regards to the Algerian operation was the communications from the, the Algeria themselves. And it seems like the British authorities, again, are kind of halfway in on the French military intervention in Mali and halfway out. They're offering the French... Uh, in intelligence and uh, some military, uh, I think, refueling stations as well. I, I'm not sure how they're they're working that, but their work. The French authorities are working close with the Algerians, who are allowing them fly over space. So it seems like the moment that the the British are out of the circle of communication. They at definitely the moment, what's are. Going on. I suppose from the Irish perspective, the silver lining on this story is, as you said, uh, Mr. McFall has been uh, released and he has made contact with his family and Irish authorities as well. So at least you know the, a plus there from Ireland's perspective. Uh, moving on, though, and you've got stories of Jerry Adams' leadership of Sinn Féin. Indeed. At a uh, conference today, he kick-started a plan to have a referendum in the North by 2012, 2020 on the creation of United Ireland. Uh, and he also announced that he is to lead Sinn Féin for another three years. Uh, he said that he will step down when the time comes, and in quotations, but that isn't now. I have more work to do. I'm interested to see what exactly that work is. A couple of things on this story. First of all, I suppose, the referendum in 2020 is an interesting one because for a lot of people, I don't think it's at the top of the agenda in terms of the relationship between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Not right now, anyway, especially with all the riots, I suppose, because a lot of people want you know, there to be peace to be maintained and that to kind of be at the top of the agenda. So, I mean, to have Sinn Féin, uh, one of the leading parties in the North, to be kind of spouting out this type of thing that they're trying to concentrate on a referendum in 2020 to unite the country is is an odd one. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Noel. And even setting aside the riots, people were more concerned about getting Ireland on track generally north and south with recession you know exactly. I think people were more focused on that rather than these uh, this I suppose what people will probably see it as a sort of pet project of Sinn Féin yeah, well, that's exactly how it should be termed. Also, though, on the note of uniting the country, Enda Kenny before Christmas was quoted as saying that he does imagine at some point in the future that Ireland will be a united republic of 32 counties. So it's interesting for a Taoiseach, like a current sitting Taoiseach, to say such a thing in public. But as I said, he said in the future, he didn't exactly describe how many years down the line. But it's uh, an interesting one. Maybe Jerry Adams thought, oh, well, if Enda's on, on board, maybe we should... Have a run to yeah, exactly. And of course, we both know that uh, Star Trek set the date <laughs> of United Ireland for 2023, so the not too far distant future. Uh, in a section that was actually not broadcast on the BBC because it oh, talked really? about that. Yeah, That's it was broadcast in the US, uh, and it was uh, it, before it was shown in Ireland. It actually had the uh, the heading: "This is a fictional show." So. <laughs> Just to make sure, in case you, you know... Exactly, in case the android and the teleportation didn't give it away. <laughs> didn't give it away, yeah. We'll have to wait and see, so is tre our Trekkies, you know, will they be delighted in 2020, 2023? Because Ireland could be reunited. We'll have to wait and see. Moving on, though, to the whole horse meat fiasco, which, of course, has consumed everybody's lives for the last <laughs> uh, two days. Puns are plenty around the place, but there's going to be na nay a pun here. That's oh. why poor attempt at it there. Uh, the latest is the Department of Agriculture are expected to announce the results of further tests they've carried out on the horse meat and indeed the traces of pig meat as well. Um, examples were sent away for vets to look at and they're due sometime this evening so we're just waiting for that to come out. It's presumed that the Department of Agriculture are actually going to release the information to the public. I think because there's been such a furore about it, it'd be strange for them not to release that type of information and uh, I suppose the two uh, factories in question, Silvercrest Food in Bally Bay and Liffey Meats in Bally James Duff. They're probably interested to see what exactly has been found as well because they're under a lot of pressure at the moment. You know, you'd wonder if the likes of Tesco and Dunn's, are they going to, you know, pull their contracts with them? Yeah, that seems more and more likely as time goes on, uh, especially with Tesco running a full page ad there today. Yes, their advert uh, today was in several newspapers. You might have seen it. They carried the line. We and our suppliers have let you down and we apologise. So, yeah. I mean, in fairness to them, you know, pretty ballsy thing to do, yeah. to put it in the newspaper. They've, you know, they're standing out going, look, we messed up, we're sorry. It's interesting that the government is coming out and saying that this is an example of what a fantastic food safety authority we have. Yet the question that always kind of is in my mind is, is this only the first time that they've detected it? Like, how long was this going on beforehand? Yeah, opposition parties obviously have jumped at this as a way to kick 
kick the government down a notch or two. And Micheál Martin came out and you know he's been critical of the fact that the results only came out now because tests were carried out in November and again in December. How is it taking this long for it to get, reach the public? Uh, Minister for Public Expenditure Brendan Howland has explained it by saying that the Food Safety Authority tests, they were carried out in November and December but needed to be verified and to do that they had to send them to Germany and then they were made conclusive last Friday. So that is why we're only hearing about it now. Now my own personal uh, conspiracy theory on it, uh, Alan, is the fact that, you know, if they release the information in December, would there have been a knock-on effect for the Christmas market? You know, the economy could have took a bit of a hit, people would have been worried, you know, about what they were buying. So maybe that's something as well that was at the back of their mind niggling away that they could have had a serious... Yeah. The um, more you tell me about this, the more it makes sense actually, dare I say. And it was that the tests had been completed in December, weren't they? They, they had. Were? The, again, according to the government, they were waiting for, you know, it to be conclusive yeah. um, according to the German laboratories involved but that's my own personal thinking on it. Um, have you heard of anyone who knows for a fact or anything that they definitely get horse meat or? You know what I actually only eat burgers from the butcher that have been ground up in mince. I'm, I'm okay. rather reluctant to eat that anyway, not because I'm afraid of horse in it. I'm actually, I probably eat horse burgers anyway. That's my own personal preference, but I'd rather they were labeled horse burgers if I knew that I was getting horse meat in them. But the, uh, the idea, the question to me isn't that, uh oh, there's horse meat in it. It's what else is in them. Is yeah, the question that kind of worries me. Uh, interestingly, a lot of charities have come out and said, don't just bin all of this food. Um, there are, you know, loads of hungry people around the country who'd eat them, you know, and they probably wouldn't mind the fact that there's a little bit of horse meat or pig meat in them. They know it now, um, so they're asking for them not to be to be dumped. And like, no shop has actually confirmed what they're actually doing with the products yet. So yeah. I guess we'll have to watch this space. There's another news story about 10,000 of the burgers being used to um, make uh, fuel for cars, I believe it is. Um, mm. So they're going to use the fat within the burgers as a renewable fuel source. So that's good. That's 10,000 burgers taken care of. All they have to do is take care of the other few hundred thousand. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like you said, it's not exactly like the food is, is dangerous. Yeah, there's nothing wrong consume. with it. There's no health risk here. Yeah. It's just a case of this meat shouldn't have been there. So I suppose if at least it went to some good. Yeah, that'll be a little bit of a silver lining on the story. Exactly. Um, moving on though, and this is another interesting story that emerged this afternoon. A Donegal councillor, Sean McEnough, a Fianna Fáiler, he got himself into a bit of hot water after he made some controversial remarks on uh, a radio station today, and we're going to be showing or letting you listen to a clip of it in just a couple of minutes. Uh, just to give you a backstory though, he was speaking to Niall Delaney on Ocean FM in Sligo, when in relation to travellers, he said that he thought there should be an isolated community, to quote him, um, for travellers. He was speaking in relation to a house that had been purchased by Donegal County Council for €233,000 to house a traveller family of 13. So uh, we'll let you listen to the clip and uh, yeah, make of it what you will. An, an isolated community? Yeah. Do you think there should be no integration at all of travellers in the community? They should be, they should be isolated, you say? Uh, well, uh, for, uh, for housing purposes? Uh, for, for them, there should be a community of themselves together. Oh, dare I ask the question uh, with regards idea of, of putting travellers in, in different communities. I would have already thought they're in separate communities already, that they are uh, segregated enough from the mainstream society that in fact what should be done is probably a greater degree of integration. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's that type of question. Is he kind of hinting at some sort of concentration camp? Yes, and of course we'll all remember that the Ar it was an Irishman that invented concentration camps, Lord Kitchener, which is... Um, not exactly a notch on our belt that we're proud of. No, uh, unfortunately. Not You'd biggest. also question what type of media training has this councillor got to say such a thing? Yeah, absolutely. And it, this is this is part of the... Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, moving on though, on our final story tonight, um, Alan, I'm not sure if this is of interest to you, but the World Wildlife Fund, that wasn't a dig, uh, <laughs> the World Wildlife Fund have announced that pubic lice are in serious danger of going extinct. Well, Noel, I'm always concerned about the endangered species. I'm very much a, um, a humanitarian yeah, okay. in that regard. Uh, but no, I, I don't have any personal experience with this or uh, 
<laughs> just to get it on record. Yeah, just to get it on he's record. He's A-OK, -okay, ladies. Um, yeah, but this is apparently because of hair removal. Yes, it's right? due to an increase in body grooming um, that's led to this endangerment. I suppose with the rise of, you know, additional shaving on both men and women, and I suppose things like vajazzling, um, you know, pubic lice are being made homeless. Well, I didn't actually know that vajazzling was a word, though, so thanks okay, for educating me on that. But I'll, uh, I'll show you a couple of diagrams later. But apparently this is part of the reason why uh, hats became less popular as well, because people wore hats as a way of covering up their lice-infested hair, oh. uh, hair in the past. So, you know, with the... I don't know what sort of displays Just, will uh, result from the An interesting turn in evolution, kind of as such. Um, but entomologist Ian Burgess um, with the WWF said that public grooming has led to a severe depletion of crab louse populations. Add to that other aspects of body hair depilation, which is hair removal, and you can see an environmental disaster in the making for, in the making for this species. Yeah, so that's um, the word I was looking for, environmentalism. Um, <laughs> I said humanitarian. But, but it's an environmental disaster? I don't know, is it? No, I, I can't say it is. I mean, like, this is the, the question that, that some people say about global warming, like if polar bears can't survive, like, yeah. they should kick it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but there is definitely the argument to be made that uh, this is a part of the, the process of evolution anyway, that I'm afraid that the body lice might not make it. Yeah, alas, uh, our thoughts are with uh, pubic lice all across the country. Uh, that's it for tonight's edition of the News at 7. Don't forget tonight live here at uh, 10 o'clock on FECTV.com. Myself and Alan will be talking to Chris Keena, manager of HMV in Limerick, and about his staff who are sitting in. We'll talk to you then.